Here's an interesting article entitled Einstein vs. Bergson, Science vs. Philosophy and the Meaning of Time. The article, which includes two audios, features an interview with historian of science Jimena Canales. In the interview, Dr. Canales talks of a heated dispute in 1922 between Albert Einstein, who had recently achieved worldwide fame with relativity, and one of the preeminent French philosophers of the day, André Bergson. The dispute between the two famous thinkers of the day was centered on none other than the very nature of time itself. Bergson was considered the leading philosopher on what, on what one might call the philosophy of time. In his philosophy of time, Bergson had clearly elucidated the fact that there was a clear distinction to be made between the subjective experience of a person being outside of time as he watched time passing by and the physical time that clots measured. Whereas Einstein, on the other hand, defiantly declared to the philosophers that the time of the philosophers did not exist. In other words, Einstein held that only physical time existed and that Bergson's belief that there was a mental perspective of time that was outside of time was wrong. I'm now going to upload one of the audios from the article. I have to say that that day exploded and was referenced over and over again throughout the 20th century. And I think the key sentence here is something that Einstein said. And he said, that the time of the philosophers did not exist. And this was extremely scandalous because he had been invited by philosophers. He was speaking at the Société Française de Philosophie and you had this physicist who had was becoming extremely famous say very clearly in these words, the time of the philosophers does not exist. And Bergson, who was present, was clearly outraged. And what, um, did, what did that mean, the time of the philosophers did not exist? He basically said that the philosophers based their theories on these psychological ways of understanding time, and the new physical knowledge had proved that these psychological ways of understanding time were really errors of our mind. They were nothing but uh, ideas that it didn't have an objective reality the way that physicists understood time did have that objective reality. Mm. Why was this such a problem for Henri Bergson, given that what Einstein was saying was there is an objective rule, I can show you that light goes at a particular speed, there is a time lag, which would mean that two things happening at the same time is not what really happens in objective reality. If he keeps on saying that, why was that an issue for Bergson in regard to the notion of psychological time versus, I guess, real time, for a better word. One thing is pretty clear. You know, here's a physicist talking to philosophers, and he's saying, your time, the time that you talk about in your things, is not something that exists in objective reality. So that's sufficiently uh, provocative. Added to that is the fact that Bergson is the expert on time. And the third element is that Bergson really always wanted to think about time in a way that included the human. By that, he meant everyday life, everyday experience, our perception of time in many, many ways. Uh, one of the metaphors that he frequently used was we need to think of time in terms of waiting for a lump of sugar to dissolve in a glass of water. That's just one of the examples in which you can see how Bergson was very tight to, very committed to the view that when we talk about time, we're also talking about humans and we're talking about human consciousness and human perception. And it is valid 
to think of time as the physicists did, as uh, something that's measured by clocks. But he wanted to go beyond that, and he wanted to ask, why do we build clocks in the first place? And he argued that if we didn't have a prior sense of time that was given to us by clocks, we wouldn't have been led to build clocks. And we wouldn't even use them if it wasn't because we wanted to go places and we had certain events that mattered while others didn't matter. So you can see that their point of view is really very different. They had different views about time. They had different views about the role of science and philosophy in the modern world of this broad division in modernity between the humanities and the sciences. This was really an interesting article to read and audio to listen to, and I encourage people at their leisure and when and if they have the time to read the article and listen to both the audios. It is also interesting to note that this disagreement between Bergson and Einstein over the exact nature of time, and as the following article points out, was one of the primary reasons that Einstein never received a Nobel Prize for relativity. In the following video, I think Dr. Soares does an excellent job of capturing the chief objection to Einstein's physical time. To paraphrase Dr. Soares, it is impossible for us to be persons experiencing now if we are nothing but particles flowing in space-time. Moreover, for us to refer to ourselves as persons, we cannot refer to space-time as the ultimate substratum upon which everything exists. We must refer to a person who is not bound by space-time. In other words, we must refer to God. And as Professor Raymond Tallis states in the following article, the project of understanding time is to try to get a clear and just idea of the nature of the relationship between the universe and the observer in respect of time, and that by placing human consciousness at the heart of time, it is possible to crack ajar a door through which a sense of possibility can stream. And in the following video entitled, The Mind and It's Now, Stanley Jockey, who is also a very well respected philosopher in his own right, recounts another encounter that Einstein had in 1935 with another respected philosopher who was named Rudolf Carnap. So, let's go back to Carnap's visit to Einstein. It was an 18-hour trip by train at that time from Chicago to Princeton. We do not have the tape recording of the conversation, because there were no such things at that time. But from Carnap's writing, we can reconstruct of what went on. So, Carnap asked Einstein, can physics demonstrate the existence of the now in order to make the notion of now into a scientifically valid term? Einstein's answer was categorical. He said, the experience of the now cannot be turned into an object of physical measurement. It can never be part of physics. This, of course, followed from the conviction widely shared by Einstein and by other physicists that relativity theory has abolished 
simultaneity. Relativity theory did not do anything of that sort. It is argued that any measurement of the moment of the now is already a moment of the past by the time the data of measurements reach the observer. A fuller meaning of exactly what Carnap meant in his question to Einstein of the now can also be read in fuller context in this following article. I would like to focus in on exactly what Einstein was asked by Rudolf Carnap on that train in 1935. Einstein was specifically asked, can physics demonstrate the existence of the now in order to make the notion of now into a scientifically valid term? And again, Einstein's answer was categorical. Einstein answered, the experience of the now cannot be turned into an object of physical measurement. It can never be a part of physics. Even Sean Carroll, a well-known theoretical physicist who is also an outspoken atheist, in the following article seems to also concede that a person's experience of the now is outside of time and yet also holds, as Einstein held, that the now is quote-unquote invalid in science. Specifically, Sean Carroll stated, you can view your daily life as occurring entirely in the present moment. The present moment has no interval. It is always here, endlessly renewing itself. This implies that the now is actually outside time. It can be defined either as instantaneous or eternal. Both are valid as verbal descriptions, but in the end, invalid, since the vocabulary of time doesn't apply to the, the timeless. Carroll's claim that the now is invalid in science, and Einstein's claim that the now cannot be turned into an object of physical measurement are very interesting claims for them to make, since the experience of the now has, from many recent experiments in quantum mechanics, established itself as being central to quantum theory. In fact, in his article, Sean Carroll himself specifically stated that the now can be defined as either instantaneous or eternal. And although Carroll held that such a definition of the now was quote-unquote invalid in science, I hold that quantum mechanics now gives us evidence for both the instantaneous and eternal aspects of the now which Carl had alluded to specifically. The instantaneous aspect of the now in quantum mechanics is revealed by instantaneous quantum entanglement in space as the following article points out. All results so far support quantum mechanics it seems that when two particles undergo entanglement, whatever happens to one of the particles can instantly affect the other, even if the particles are separated. And despite all the ill-founded hope of Einstein and other materialists, that hidden variables between particles might someday explain away the instantaneous spooky action at a distance that is found in quantum mechanics. Despite all that ill-founded hope of materialists, the fact of the matter is that multiple mathematical theorems have all but proven that hidden variables between particles cannot explain away the instantaneous spooky action at a distance that is now found in quantum mechanics. 
Besides these multiple mathematical theorems that have all but proven that hidden variables between particles do not exist, it has now also been experimentally confirmed that entangled objects do not cause each other to behave the way they do. Simply put, with the uh, refutation of hidden variables, there is no cause within space-time that materialists can appeal to in order to explain away this instantaneous spooky action at a distance witnessed in quantum mechanics. As the following article states, our results give weight to the idea that quantum correlations somehow arise from outside space-time in the sense that no story in space and time can describe them. Whereas, on the other hand, I, as a Christian, have a beyond space and time cause that I can readily appeal to in order to explain instantaneous quantum entanglement. Specifically, Colossians 1.17, He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. Moreover, besides the instantaneous as aspect of the now being confirmed by quantum mechanics, I hold that the e eternal aspect of the now which Sean Carroll also alluded to in his article, is now confirmed in quantum mechanics by what is termed quantum entanglement in time. As Professor Kroll states in the following article, entanglement can occur across two quantum systems that never coexisted. It implies that the measurements carried out by your eye upon starlight falling through your telescope this winter somehow dictated the polarity of photons more than 9 billion years old. It is also interesting to point out that this experiment for quantum entanglement in time is very friendly to Dr. Michael Egnor's theistic contention via Aristotle that perception at a distance is no more inconceivable than action at a distance. And it is also interesting to point out that this finding from quantum mechanics refutes Dr. Vincent Torley's objection against Dr. Egnor that perception cannot possibly occur at a distance. For example, Dr. Torley held that perception cannot possibly be at a supernova which ceased to exist nearly 200 millennia ago, long before the dawn of human history. Yet, despite Dr. Torley's objection to uh, Dr. Egnor that the, so, uh, that the supernova no longer exists, and to repeat, quantum entanglement in time implies that the measurements carried out by your eye upon starlight falling through your telescope this winter somehow dictated the polarity of the photons more than 9 billion years old. Of related interest to this, in the following article, Dr. Michael Egnor points out that Aristotle anticipated quantum mechanics thousands of years before quantum mechanics was discovered by modern science. And all of the preceding evidence is certainly very strong evidence that the experience of the now is, contrary to what Einstein and Carroll thought possible, very much a part of experimental physics. I hold the following delayed choice experiment in quantum mechanics to be an even more dramatic demonstration of the now's central importance in quantum mechanics. 
specifically in the following experiment that was performed with atoms instead of photons, it was proved that measurement is everything. At the quantum level, reality does not exist if you are not looking at it. The theistic implications of this experiment are fairly obvious. As Professor Scott Aronson quipped, Look, we all have fun ridiculing creationists. But if we accept the usual picture of quantum mechanics, then in a certain sense the situation is far worse. The world, as you experience it, might as well not have existed 10 to the negative 43 seconds ago. Thus, contrary to Einstein and Carroll falsely claiming that the experience of the now can never be a part of physics, the fact of the matter is that the experience of the now, as far as quantum mechanics itself is concerned, is very much a part of modern day experimental physics. Moreover, besides being shown to be wrong in his claim that the experience of the now can never be a part of physics, quantum mechanics goes even goes one step further and falsifies Einstein's belief that he had no free will. As you can see in the following quotes, Einstein denied that he had free will and he believed that free will was just an illusion. And although Einstein denied he had free will, quantum mechanics once again falsifies Einstein's contention that he had no free will. As Steven Weinberg states in the following article, in quantum mechanics, humans are brought into the laws of nature at their most fundamental level. The instrumentalist approach of quantum mechanics turns its back on a vision that became possible after Darwin of a world governed by impersonal physical laws that control human behavior along with everything else. In quantum mechanics, these probabilities do not exist until people choose what to measure. Unlike the case of classical physics, a choice must be made. And as leading experimental physicist Anton Zeilinger states in the following video, what we perceive as reality now depends on our earlier decision what to measure, which is a very, very deep message about the nature of reality and our part in the whole universe. We are not just passive observers. Thus, despite Einstein's denial of his own free will, the fact of the matter is that quantum mechanics once again refutes Einstein. To sum it up, Einstein's claim that the experience of the now cannot be turned into an object of physical measurement and his claim that free will is an illusion and does not exist are both now refuted by advances in quantum mechanics. Moreover, the fact that both the experience of the now and free will, which are unique and even defining properties of the immaterial mind, and that they figure so prominently in quantum mechanics, tells us fairly clearly that the immaterial mind itself must be primary in quantum mechanics. In fact, when putting several lines of experimental evidence together from quantum mechanics, we find that the argument for God from consciousness can now be framed like this. Consciousness either precedes all of material reality or is an epiphenomena of material reality. Two. If consciousness is a epiphenomena of material reality, then consciousness will be found to have no special position within material reality, 
whereas conversely, if consciousness precedes material reality, then consciousness will be found to have a special position within material reality. 3. Consciousness is found to have a special, even central, position within material reality. 4. Therefore, consciousness is found to precede material reality. And although quantum mechanics has now refuted Einstein's prior materialistic beliefs that he held against free will and that he held against the experience of the now, nonetheless it is still important to note that both Einstein's special and general theories of relativity fit hand in glove with what Christian theists would presuppose about the structure of reality. Specifically, as the following video shows, whereas atheists have no compelling evidence for all the various parallel universe and or multiverse scenarios that they had put forth, Christians, on the other hand, as this following video shows, can appeal directly to the higher dimensional mathematics behind quantum mechanics, behind special relativity, behind general relativity, to support their belief that, number one, God upholds this universe in its continual existence, as well as, number two, to support their belief in a heavenly dimension and, a, and in a hellish dimension. Thus, in conclusion, Although Einstein himself denied that he believed in a personal God, the fact of the matter is that Einstein's very own work in special and general relativity strongly supports what the Christian theist presupposes about the structure of reality beforehand. A related note to all this, Kurt Gödel who was Einstein's closest confidant at Princeton and who proved that mathematics was incomplete and that you therefore, not, therefore cannot have a purely mathematical theory of everything without allowing God to bring completeness to that theory. Kurt Gödel himself had this to say about Einstein's religion. Specifically, he stated, Einstein's religion was more abstract, like Spinoza in Indian philosophy. Spinoza's God is less than a person. Mine is more than a person because God can play the role of a person. Well, that's the end of the video. And... Again, I remind viewers that all papers and videos referenced in this video may be accessed in the link provided in the video description. Thanks very much for watching.